Hello and welcome to Studio 415. On today's show, you'll get to hear how NAC's teachers have been receiving an education. You'll hear an explanation of what the new graduation requirements are. And you'll see how the boys basketball season is going. All that and more, coming up next. The message is needed, I think, at the elementary level and at the high school level. Basketball is about adapting to changes and adapting to what happens in the game and the way you respond to an event is going to determine the outcome. Five, four, three, two, one, take camera two. Welcome to Studio 415. I'm Cameron Yamas. And I'm Daisy Macias. With graduation just beyond the horizon, Carroll High School moves on to prepare the freshmen through junior classes for the future. Studio 415 reporter Gage Fisher has more on how the road to graduation may look different for Carroll. The class of 2023 will have new requirements for students in order to graduate. I take a look at these requirements and how students can try and meet them. With over 2,000 students enrolled and a majority in career technical education courses, Carroll is a school focused on preparing its students for their future in college and careers. In the last few years, students in the current junior and sophomore classes have been subject to notable changes to Carroll's curriculum regarding the honors, STEM, and dual credit classes. One noticeable development has been the removal of honors math classes for the implementing of STEM category courses, such as Algebra 2 STEM, STEM being meant for those looking for a future in science, technology, engineering, and math. Carroll's Head of Guidance, Sally Gerber, states that this change is meant for students' preparation for college courses. Sometimes kids would say, I just want to do the honors because I just want to get that grade bump. We want to try to get kids to kind of start thinking about I want to take that higher level, more difficult class because I want to prepare myself for those classes that I need in college. And that's what the STEM does. Another alteration students can see in the course selection guide is the emphasis of dual credit classes. Some of these include courses such as pre-calc and trig dual credit or economics dual credit, which in contrast to STEM classes are simply meant for getting students college credit. The dual credit will be really for those kids who I'm not going to major in one of those science, technology, engineering, or math majors in college. Um, so I'm going to take this dual credit because it could count towards my elementary education degree. While the class of 2021 and 2022 have their own changes for college preparation, the class of 2023 has a new path for graduation in which these STEM and dual credit classes may prove to be useful. The state of Indiana has decided that I-STEP is no longer going to be the graduation requirement. Instead, they've put in um, graduation requirements that they hope will help all students be prepared for life after high school. Without I-STEP, Northwest Allen County Schools is following new state graduation requirements in the form of separate boxes, with the hope being that by completing these tasks, students will be well prepared for life after high school. Box 1, for example, is simply meeting all of the requirements for the desired diploma type, such as Core 40 or Academic Honors. Meanwhile, Box 2 is focused on employability skills, which can be categorized into either project-based, service-based, or work-based learning. Students only need to complete one of the categories, for many of which can be completed through enrolling in various career-based classes such as engineering or extracurriculars such as sports and activities. Finally, Box 3 is focused on post-secondary readiness, which functions as a simple checklist in which students must complete at least one of the several items in order to graduate. The list includes tasks such as receiving a sufficient score on the SAT or receiving an academic or technical honors diploma. Class of 2023 guidance counselor Emily Knurk emphasizes that this system should be meant for students to have a plan for life after high school, providing students with graduation pathways to do so. Although this information may seem overwhelming to many students at first, Knurk assures students that there's nothing to worry about. If we want to change our mind, you know, if I, instead of uh, having a part-time job, you decide that you're going to take it, that's fine. But we also need to make sure that we're checking off each box because these are graduation requirements and we cannot graduate without the box two, box three. But again, stay calm. Um, we'll, we'll, get it, we'll get it figured out. Nothing to panic about. For Studio 415, I'm Gage Fisher. Two weeks ago, while most students enjoyed a two-hour delay at home, some teachers were given information on the topic of social-emotional learning. In my story, you'll see what the presentation entailed and how this will benefit students in the district. 
On the morning of February 10th, elementary school teachers and instructors gathered at Carroll High School to hear from Dr. Lori Desatellis, an assistant professor at Butler University who specializes in neuroscience. She spoke on the topic of social-emotional learning, which is a way for both children and adults to understand and manage their emotions while also expressing empathy and maintaining positive relationships. In the presentation, Desatellis explained the impact of adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, on a student's ability to perform well in school. ACEs are traumatic events that have negative lasting effects on health and well-being. ACEs can come in many forms, ranging from physical and mental abuse to household dysfunction. Although it may not seem common, Desatella states that 67% of the population has at least one ACE. With this prevalence, there is an importance to implement alternative ways to address students who misbehave. Rather than immediately condemning their actions, Desatella suggests implementing brain breaks, such as alternating between a peace sign and the OK sign, to decrease adrenaline and stress students may be internalizing. Dela Abernathy, Northwest Allen County Schools social worker, believes that a greater focus on students' mental health will positively impact their abilities and academic growth. There was a wave of interest um, uh, previously in academics and being very knowledge focused and uh, maybe that's where um, testing was birthed from, right? And this really focus on testing and having that being a, a, a useful measurement system. Okay, now we have that, but how can we manage the stress of those things? And how can we look at um, those other elements of a person in order to do the test? As this presentation was done just for the benefit of primary schools, some may question the worth of cutting class times district-wide as well. Hickory Center Elementary School teacher Jason Lance expresses the importance of this information in an age where stress and anxiety has increased. The message is needed, I think, at the elementary level and at the high school level. I think with the stress and anxiety that so many students are experiencing and so many um, environmental factors and just outside factors that are affecting students' education, I think the training for the, for the staff is going to be beneficial for the staff and the students. Using the instruction from Desatellis, teachers can be better equipped to help students coping with their mental health. That can aid with not only their performance in school, but also setting the foundation for personal growth. To prevent passively receiving this material, representatives from each school broke out into session with Desatellis after the presentation. In this meeting, the representatives thought critically about the implementation of social-emotional learning into their classrooms. Examples of application include the use of the previously mentioned brain breaks, as well as encouraging students to describe their emotions using sensory adjectives. This method allows for students to better understand their feelings instead of repressing them or channeling them through disobedience. By providing this presentation, NAGS has shined a light on a topic that many students may feel vulnerable speaking about otherwise. Alan Bodenstein, an adaptive physical education teacher at NAGS, feels that this awareness is essential to creating a safe environment for students. I think the district bringing this, this to us you know, shows that they care about this um, and that it's real and it's not, just, you know, it's not made up. These, you know, these kids with trauma come into school every day um, and some of it is, is just horrific and we don't know. These kids are just, a lot of times the kids are coming to school because it's a safe place to be. You know, we need to make sure that they continue to feel that. The middle and high school teachers will also be receiving this training on our second plan to our delay on March 11th. For to do for 15, I'm Daisy Macias. The Chargers Challenge has been throwing it back to games that we loved as a child. This week, the challenge is to see who is the last person standing in musical chairs. Welcome to week five of the Charger Challenge. I'm your host, Andy Newman, and today we're going to have five contestants playing musical chairs all the win. Studio 415 Cup. Hot Bartles. My name is Skylar Swing, went to Pioneer Ridge Elementary, and I'm going to win because I'm a basketball manager. Um, I'm Allison, I went to Riverdale Elementary School, and I'm going to win because I'm big body. Right, I'm Aiden Williams, I went to Washington Center Elementary, and I'm going to win because I might be losing my voice, but I don't lose at musical chairs. Hi, my name is Anissa, I went to Cedar Canyon, and I'm going to win because I'm 5'7". My name is Chloe Nuttall, I went to Oakview Elementary, and I'm going to win because I'm getting out my trick homework right now. I uh, really don't know what's going to happen here, folks. Don't know anybody that's good. Usually, uh, being shorter is better in musical chairs, so I'm going to go with Chloe. I think Chloe might win this one, but who knows? Skylar might pull it out. Oh, 
And okay. look who's on. It's an Aiden or is it Skyler? It is Aiden. Skyler has just lost. Skyler is out of the competition. All right, round two here after Skyler is first out. Um, I'm still going to go with Chloe. We've got some good contestants, though. And let's see. The music is about to stop. Oh, Aiden is out. Aiden is out. That is surprising. What happened? Um, I lost. She was shorter than me. She sat down quicker than me. It's unfortunate. Both of the guys are out now. It's all girls. Um, and it's anybody's game. Oh, and Anissa is out. What happened? Let's get rid of the We're on to the final round here. It's Chloe and Allison. It's really anybody's game. Both of these girls are pretty good. I'm still betting on Chloe. Let's see what happens here. Uh, music keeps playing. Studio 415, the best song ever. Oh my gosh, folks. Let's see. Oh, oh my gosh. Amazing play by Chloe. Just a great job. She has just won. I can't fight this one. That's my jam, sorry. So, After the challenge, Chloe has won. Chloe, how do you feel? I feel amazing. I mean, Studio 415 is my jam, so. How do you guys feel? Anybody? I was robbed. He was robbed. I was robbed. Charge a challenge. As the boys' basketball team nears the end of its regular season, we take a look back at how the year is going so far. Studio 4 for senior reporter Andy Newman dives into the team's recent big wins and the season as a whole in this week's spotlight. As the Carroll Boys basketball regular season begins to wrap up, all eyes turn to a postseason run. The Chargers began their season with a win over Penn on November 19th. The team continued their success going 5-1 into the holiday tournament with one loss coming in a close battle at Norwell. Carroll continued their run, beating rival Snyder in the SAC Holiday Tournament Championship to become the first Carroll Boys basketball team to win the tournament since joining the conference. After the tournament, the Chargers have gone 8-4 and four with a current record of 16-5 and five with one regular season game remaining. Key wins on the season include Shenandoah, the number one ranked team in 2A, and arch rival Homestead. The latest of these wins come against Homestead last Friday night in a 61-53 thriller. The team's key losses include back-to-back -back home losses to Bishop Blewers and a nail-biter loss to Snyder by one point. With the two SAC losses, Carroll was essentially knocked out of contention for a third straight conference championship, lending them a respectable tie for a second place finish. Even with the disappointing SAC finish, senior guard Micah Kirk believes that the team has learned a lot from their losses. Well, we've just learned that not everything's going to go our way, and basketball is about adapting to changes and adapting to what happens in the game, and the way you respond to an event is going to determine the outcome. Kirk and the team remains positive with the belief that they're in a great position for a postseason run. Uh, we, we just have to be able to play with our edge. Uh, if we can have a focus attack against the teams, we've done very well against them, and if we can continue this, hopefully we can have good things to come in the sectional tournament. If you'd like to come and support the Carroll Boys basketball squad, the team hosts opponent Warsaw this Friday night for senior night with JV tip off at 6 p.m. Or sectional play will begin at the Charger Fieldhouse on March 3rd. For Studio 415, I'm Andy Newman. That's all we have for today. Thanks for watching. If there is a story that you'd like us to cover, please send an email to Mr. Johnston. For all of us here at Studio 415, have a great week, Carroll. Sunny days and friendly smiles, walk the halls with me. Studio